the heedlessness of the people of Noah's day will be duplicated in the last days of our world's history. It will be a day much like ours, a day when ideologies like socialism can sneak in without much attention. Will this be the political philosophy on the earth when the tribulation begins? I believe it will. Socialism is tailor-made for the Antichrist appearance. It creates global conditions that bring great stress and trouble, difficult days that will be hard to bear. And it demands a one-world system of government, which Scripture says will be established before the end of history. Revelation 13 describes the Antichrist as a beast having vast power and authority. The whole world marveled and gave allegiance to the beast. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and every language and nation and all the people who belong to the world. There's coming a day when there will be a leader who will be in charge of the whole world. He will be the central authority for everybody in every place on planet Earth. And you think that's not possible, but it is. And if this pandemic had been worse than it has been, you would have probably seen more of that than you have seen already. Are we living in the end times? There may have never been another time in history when end times prophecy has been more aligned with the culture and circumstances of the world than it is today. I believe there are 10 phenomena we are witnessing today that were recorded centuries ago in Bible prophecy. Seeing our circumstances in light of these prophecies should give us resolve, purpose, and hope. And help us answer the questions. What are we to do with the world around us? What hope do we have in times like these? And ultimately, where do we go? from here. Are the public cries for shared wealth and government control a sign of the end times? Many of the troubles we're seeing today in our culture can be tied to the growing foothold of specific ideologies. How does politics play into prophecy? Join Dr. David Jeremiah for this special prophecy edition of Turning Point as he presents a sign of the end times. Socialism a cultural prophecy. Under the cover of darkness, a middle-aged man inched out of the window of his seventh-story apartment and then silently repelled 75 feet to the ground. A pair of bolt cutters snipped off his ankle monitor and the man jumped into a waiting car. No, this is not a movie. After 15 years of imprisonment on bogus charges, Ivan Simonovis was escaping from Venezuela. In 2014, Ivan had been moved to house arrest to seek treatment for 19 chronic health conditions, most of which had been caused by his imprisonment. Knowing this was his only chance, he arranged his daring escape. And after speeding off in a car, he spent three weeks evading security in a cat and mouse pursuit. A 14-hour ride in a small fishing boat got him to a Caribbean island, and from there he flew to the United States. Ivan could recall when Venezuela was the wealthiest nation in South America. The per capita income of its citizens was greater than those of China and Japan, almost rivaling the income of U.S. citizens. The people of Ivan's generation enjoyed religious liberty and political freedom and personal dignity and economic opportunity. But when the oil prices crashed in the 1980s and then again in the 90s, the Venezuelan economy experienced a dip and then that dip became a dive in 1998 and the Venezuelan people elected Hugo Chavez as their president. Once in power, Chavez relentlessly implemented the socialist playbook formulated by the Soviet Union, Cuba, and China, and other nations. His first task was to rewrite the Venezuelan Constitution, 
guaranteeing citizens the so-called free rights of government, provided health care, free college education, and social justice. When the Supreme Court ruled against Chavez on several important issues, he responded by stacking the court with 12 new justices, all of which were loyal to him. Socialism totally engulfed the country when Chavez was reelected in 2006. Fully in control of the courts and the legislature, he moved quickly to nationalize the media, removing every voice of dissent. Then he authorized government agencies to seize privately owned wealth and property from Venezuela citizens, all in the name of fairness and equity. Chavez took control of the nation's oil industry. He expelled all the foreign investors. He nationalized power companies and farms and mines and banks and grocery stores. And his final step was to eliminate term limits for elected officials, setting himself up to rule for the rest of his life in the style of Russia's Stalin and Cuba's Castro. Does any of this sound familiar to you? Not even Chavez could evade the last enemy. He died from cancer in 2013, but his hand-picked successor, Nicolas Maduro, continued to implement Chavez's agenda, even going further in some areas to force a Marxist system on the Venezuelan people. Today, Venezuela is descending into anarchy. Record numbers of Venezuela migrants are fleeing northward trying to reach the border of the United States. Right now, you may be wondering what all of this has to do with you. I mean, if Venezuela has proven that socialism is a bad idea, why should anybody care? Well, you should care. You should really care. Because socialist visions and policies are invading the United States. You'll hear it discussed under four different names. Some people call it socialism, communism, Marxism and cultural Marxism. Socialism seems to hold some sort of hypnotic power over many thinkers and is spilling into the common culture. A 2020 poll showed that 40% of Americans had a favorable view of socialism. This was up from 36% in 2019 and even more frightening 47% of the millennials and 49% of Generation Z view socialism favorably. Indeed, one 2019 poll found in Axis that 61% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 have a positive reaction to socialism. When Jesus was describing what it would be like on earth just before he returned, here is what he said. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. What were those days of Noah like? Genesis 6, 5 describes them this way. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The people of Noah's day ignored and ridiculed his warnings. Noah built and preached for 120 years and not one single individual outside of his immediate family believed him. The people were so indifferent that they didn't understand what was happening until it was too late. The heedlessness of the people of Noah's day will be duplicated in the last days of our world's history. It will be a day much like ours, a day when ideologies like socialism can sneak in without much attention. Will this be the political philosophy on the earth when the tribulation begins? I believe it will. Socialism is tailor-made for the Antichrist's appearance. It creates global conditions that bring great stress and trouble, difficult days that will be hard to bear. And it demands a one-world system of government, which Scripture says will be established before the end of history. Revelation 13 describes the Antichrist as a beast having vast power and authority. The whole world 
marveled and gave allegiance to the beast. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and every language and nation and all the people who belong to the world. There's coming a day when there will be a leader who will be in charge of the whole world. He will be the central authority for everybody in every place on planet Earth. And you think that's not possible, but it is. And if this pandemic had been worse than it has been, you would have probably seen more of that than you have seen already. So I've introduced all of this and I've talked about socialism a couple of times. What is socialism? Well, socialists believe that the world's means of production, like infrastructure, farms, factories, energy, natural resources, medicines, and more, should be under the control of, quote, unquote, the people. In other words, society as a whole should own all the raw materials and the systems that produce wealth. In a free market system, these materials are controlled by companies or individuals, but in socialist countries, they are owned by the people. Of course, there's no way to make decisions based on such a loose concept as the people. So under socialism, the government becomes the sole authority and controller and the means of production. Unfortunately, governments are controlled by specific people, often the kinds of people who seek out power. And those people are entirely corruptible by greed and selfishness, lust and vindictiveness and violence and the overwhelming desire for power. As more power flows to the government, the handful at the top become dictatorial. To understand socialism as it is in our culture today, we must first understand the originator of socialism as we know it. He was a man by the name of Karl Marx. When you understand who he was and what he believed, you will be able to trace a lot that's going on in our world today right back to him. If you study the life of Karl Marx, you'll learn that he wasn't just a hater of God, he was a cheerleader for the devil. <laughs> His family thought him possessed by a demon. A biographer described him like this. He had the devil's view of the world and the devil's malignity. Sometimes he seemed to know that he was accomplishing the works of evil. Karl Marx died in despair on March 14, 1883. Just before his death, he wrote to his friend Ingalls, how pointless and empty is life, he said, and yet how desirable. He was buried in the Highgate Cemetery, considered the center of Satanism in London. Today, Karl Marx is ruling the world from his grave. And here are some of the characteristics of his ideology. Number one, Marxism is anti-God. Karl Marx hated Christianity, which he saw as a source of oppression to him, religion was the opium of the people. For communism to succeed, loyalty to the church had to be replaced by loyalty to the state. On one occasion, he described the church as medieval mildew that had to be scraped away. In spite of what many claim to believe or propose, Marxism is incompatible with the free expression of religion. I don't think you can be a Christian socialist a Christian Marxist. The things that are involved in these two uh, understandings are totally opposite. They contradict each other. So Marxism is first of all anti-God. It's not atheistic. They believe in God. They just hate him. And they try to push him out. One of their little sayings was, we're gonna rid the world of capitalists and rid heaven of God. <laughs> that was their motives. It is also characterized by totalitarianism. Now, that's a long word, but it's a word you'll understand in a moment. This fact about Marxism is one we should grasp. It quickly becomes totalitarian. The term totalitarianism was first used by supporters of dictator Benito Mussolini, who summed it up this way. Everything within the state, nothing outside the state, and nothing against the state. It's anti-God, it's totalitarian, and it's divisive. 
Marxism thrives on division. In historic Marxism, the division was promoted between classes of people, the oppressors against the oppressed, the bosses against the workers. Men like Hugo Chavez went out of their way to ensure that the poor people of his country hated the wealthy people of his country. In today's cultural Marxism in our country, the exploited divide is often racial. I believe that's one of the reasons we've lost some of the progress we've made on race relationships. Whatever it is or however far it might be removed from actual racism, Whenever a socialist or Marxist can't figure out how to respond to an issue, they always, and I mean every time, call it racist. All of us know there are still issues that need to be addressed with race relationships in America, but the true issues get lost in the avalanche of unwarranted accusations, and there's never any time to devote to the real issues that still face us. When everything is racist, then nothing is racist. And Marxism is using this divide in our country to make headway into our culture. Perhaps the most surprising thing about Marxism to me as I studied it is how deadly it has been. Christianity leads to life. Marxism leads to death. In 1999, the Black Book of Communism endeavored to attempt the impossible task of tabulating a Marxist-Leninist death toll for the 20th century. It revealed the most colossal case of political carnage in history. Latin America, 150,000 deaths. Eastern Europe, one million deaths. Vietnam, one million deaths. Africa, 1.7 million deaths. Cambodia, two million deaths. North Korea, two million deaths. USSR, 20 million deaths. China, 65 million deaths. Communism leads to death. Wherever you see it, across the globe, you will see the deadliness of it. That's all from the heart of the evil Karl Marx. So that's what it is, and obviously there's much more to socialism than what I've said. Those are some of the main characteristics. And you say, well, Pastor Jeremiah, that's a good study. So so what does that have to do with us? What does that mean? Well, I am afraid this new political trajectory in our nation is more than just a trend. It is a seismic shift toward the socialist agenda. If you look closely, you can draw the connections. First of all, the destruction of our monuments. It's become common in recent years to see news headlines or live video of protest groups surrounding, defacing, even eventually removing statues and other historical monuments they consider to be offensive. When we witness these events, we're not simply seeing a bunch of rowdy young people tearing down statues for fun. No, instead, this is a part of a concerted effort to erase the past. The first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory destroy its books, its culture, its history, then have someone write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history, and before long, the nation will forget what it is and what it was. On the contrary, it is interesting to discover that the word remember is found 164 times in the Old Testament. Socialism wants you to forget. Christianity wants you to remember. Remember the former things of old. God said through the prophet Isaiah, I am God and there is none like me. Yes, remember all that God has done for us. On the basis of past mercies, we can build a future of grace. The destruction of monuments is related to the socialist agenda. Cancel culture. Remember what I told you about socialism? It's totalitarian. Don't think it's just statutes and histories that are being torn down. It's also anyone who doesn't kneel at the altar of prevailing political passions. You are canceled if you don't agree. I want to point out that this too is a child of socialism. In cultural Marxism, there is no room for dissenting opinions. Are we seeing that? Absolutely. Number three, the dismantling of the nuclear family. Marxism reaches its icy fingers into your very home. 
Marxists want to raise your children. They want to do it, not you. That's what's going on in our schools today. They want to put all of this insidious craziness into the curriculum, starting now earlier and earlier in school. The cancel culture, the dismantling of the nuclear family. And how about this? The redistribution of wealth. That's the central thing that most people know about socialism. This ideology teaches that all human assets should be claimed by the government and redistributed to the masses in a more equitable formula. This would supposedly rid the world of poverty. But somehow it has never worked out that way. There is not one, not one single successful socialist story. They are all failures. They all lead to death and destruction and poverty. And don't give me the Scandinavian countries as an illustration because they're not socialists. Those are welfare societies. Socialism fails. Socialism is death. Socialism will lead this country to destruction and everything it was built on, everything we believe will be destroyed if we don't stop this in its tracks. Here's one that really makes sense. The defunding of the police. Socialists are especially keen on keeping the reins of law enforcement in their tight fists. In America, their first step is to villainize the police, then to fund them. And that's why some cities have slashed their police budgets. And surprise, each of these cities has seen a dramatic uptick in violent crimes in all the months that followed. Who could have thought? Whatever you do, don't miss the socialist motivation for vilifying local authorities. No matter how loudly they deny it, they are simply trying to let the local government fail so that they can federalize our cities and states and move control for all that happens to Washington. Everything you watch today is about nationalizing elections, nationalizing schools, nationalizing everything. Nationalize it, then you can control it with just a few people. So that's where we are, that's where we've been, and here we come to this question. Where do we go from here? You say, Dr. Jeremiah, I'm just one little one. What am I supposed to do about all this? How can I have any response? I mean, this is coming and I see it and I feel it and it, it touches my children and my grandchildren. So what should I do? Well, let me give you some thoughts that I hope you will carefully consider. First of all, we need to review what the Bible says. You say, well, isn't it possible for me to be socialist? Can I have a socialist concept and still be a Christian? So I'm gonna give you a really quick little survey of what the Bible says. This is from an article that I read by Al Mohler. Scripture affirms the dignity of work, Ephesians 4.28. The Bible affirms private property, Exodus 22. It condemns theft. Exodus 2015, and covetousness, Exodus 2017. It promotes saving, Proverbs 13, 22, and thrift, Proverbs 21, 20. Land ownership, Acts chapter four. Investment, Matthew chapter 25. All of these are honored in scripture, and the Bible teaches that the laborer is worthy of his wages. Socialism contradicts every single one of those biblical principles. You can't be a biblicist and believe what the socialist wants you to believe. So, review what the Bible says. You can do your own study on that. Just get a good concordance and go to work. Number two, refuse to live by lies. The Bible says there's coming a day when good will be called evil and evil will be called good, and I guess we're living in that time. But here's what I want you to know. You do not have to live by lies. Proverbs 29, 12 says, if a ruler pays attention to lies, all of his servants become wicked. So much of what we hear in our culture today has no connection to common sense. Let us refuse to live by lies. Just because somebody in power says it's true doesn't mean it's true. So review what the Bible says, that's a good thing. Refuse to live by lies. Here's another one. Resolve to be a follower of Christ and not just an admirer of Christ. More and more than ever before, we need to really be seriously asking ourselves, what does Jesus Christ want me to do in this situation? Rethink small groups. 
As many of us learned during the COVID crisis, small groups are vital in rough times. This is what happened in the early days of the church where they continued daily with one accord in the temple and in breaking bread from house to house. I believe more than ever before that as we walk into these next days with all of this craziness that's going on around us, if we are not in a small group, we are setting ourselves up to be picked off. You know, the enemy likes to isolate people and pick them off one by one. You get in a small group and you have some people that can pray for you and help you. And we need to join hands with others who can help us stay strong during the things that are happening. Number five, resist any way that you can. We ought to obey God rather than men. It's amazing what can happen if we don't just sit on our hands when people are trying to steal from us the things that mean so much to us as believers. So there are times when you can resist, and God will show you when that is, and when your heart says, I ought to, you do it. And finally, I want you to remember Venezuela. That's where we started. Today, Venezuela is a social and economic wasteland. 96% of citizens live below the poverty line. Most people earn less than a U.S. dollar per day. Poor economic management brought about inflation rates of more than 10 million percent, which is why a roll of toilet paper cost 2.6 million bolivars, the Venezuelan currency. And the lack of investment in commodities means the nation is barren of essential medicines and medical services. As a result, an estimated 5.5 million refugees have fled Venezuela, a number that represents more than a sixth of the nation's total population. In short, a country once defined by freedom and opportunity is now oppressed, barren, and hopeless. And Marxism caused it. Marxism is among the worst ideas ever conceived. Just ask its oppressed multitudes and its countless casualties. We should be aware of its history, herald its dangers, and oppose its spread. When you see these crazy people on television, and I could name a few of them, talking about how this is going to be the new face of our nation, I hope you shudder as I do, and you hit the ground and pray, never, God, let this happen to us. Well, the best news of all is this. There is coming a utopia, better than anyone can ever imagine, better than we can imagine. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 describes a time when the government will be upon the shoulder of Jesus Christ. When Jesus returns, things will be different. Amen? Our Lord, when he returns, will right all of these wrongs. He will judge between the nations. He will rebuke many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. No, friends, socialism, Marxism, and all the other ugly isms of history will be utterly destroyed when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom on this earth. And the Bible says this kingdom will be forever and ever. And it also tells us that we can be citizens of this kingdom if we will put our trust in Jesus Christ. If we will allow Jesus Christ to become our savior, he will not only just be the king of the earth, he'll be the king of our life. And I hope you have done that. I hope there's been a time in your life where you've given yourself to Jesus Christ and asked Christ to come and live within you. Thank you for joining me today on Turning Point. The more we study scripture, the more we understand that our loving God desires to have a personal relationship with each one of us. If you would like to begin that relationship and ensure that you will spend eternity with Christ, you must simply repent of your sin and ask Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior. If you've taken this step of faith today, I encourage you to share your decision with other Christians at a trustworthy ministry or a local church and to continue growing in your faith. May God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you next time right here on Turning Point.